This is a review of the 1957 Robert Wise film Until They Sail, which stars Gene Simmons, Joan Fontaine, Paul Newman, and introduces Sandra D. The screenplay for this movie was written by the singular Robert Anderson. We have covered Robert Anderson a lot on this channel. He wrote the screenplay for one of my top two movies, basically, uh, which is The Nun's Story. Uh, I reviewed uh, I Never Sang for My Father, The Sand Pebbles, and Teen Sympathy on this channel, all really interesting movies. The Sand Pebbles was also directed by Robert Wise, so this is another collaboration between those two. Robert Anderson is a favorite of mine because he writes mature films that foreground uncertainty. Um, this is one of his lesser-known works, and it certainly has flaws. Uh, this, I think the main thing is that this is a saccharine movie. Um, Anderson worked, a lot of these movies are, he sort of worked within a melodramatic context, within a genre context. Usually he was able to add something substantial to this. And here he does. Uh, this movie mainly succeeds, but where it fails um, is where it kind of gets caught up in the genre things and a couple of other things. Some of the acting in this isn't so good, but it does have sincere moments, kind of the hallmark humanist moments of Anderson. Um, it has some scenes that really snap another one of his hallmarks, and it has some strong intellectual ideas. This is a war movie that has absolutely no action in it. It's about four uh, sisters from New Zealand, four Kiwi sisters, coping with the changes to their society and their lives during World War II. Loneliness and loss, maybe ennui, some, some overarching feeling of, of loss, I guess. Um, similar in some ways to the, to the movie From Here to Eternity, um, a mature story about yearning in wartime, and one of many films from the 1950s grappling with the war, with World War II, re-examining World War II. Possibly there's some proxy for the Korean War as well, although that would have also ended at the time that this movie um, came out. So believe it or not, the U.S. I don't think was fighting any wars in 1957, but clearly this was still a salient topic. And yes, this movie was set in New Zealand. Um, we'll get to the role the Americans play in it. You wonder, well, it seems clear that this movie is also intended um, to expose some of uh, the dynamics in the United States as well. Um, this, like I said, is this movie about, you know, war, about romance. Um, but it's also a movie, I think, about moral processes, how they differ from person to person, and how we're often on our own to chart a moral path to point our moral compass in the right direction when things go awry, when the situation is extreme, right? When things, you know, when there's a world war and everything changes, how we're mostly on our own to figure out what it means to do the right thing. Like I said, this movie, I think is, to me, I took, took away that. So the main thing is these moral processes, how they, how they work. Um, the movie opens with a trial. Speaking of m moral processes, this is a formal moral process, a traditional one, maybe a patriarchal one as well. And this is in contrast to what we get for most of the movie, which focuses on informal moral processes, the moral processes of the family, the moral processes of the individual. Uh, the movie begins with the men of New Zealand leaving. There's a parade. They're in uniform and they're going off to war. Then there's a bit of a vacuum. Life kind of goes on pause. It's a bizarre time. The sisters uh, put up a world map in their house and they put pins in it for each of their loved ones. They try and figure out, they listen to the radio, they hear bulletins. They try to figure out where to put the pin. Sometimes the, the place where the fighting is going on, they can't even find it on the map. The war is absurd. A bizarre turn of events that's unprecedented, that introduces these new cycles, these new patterns that seem logical, but also totally bizarre. Then American soldiers arrive. And here we get to one of the central ideas of the movie, right, which is sort of the fraught romance between the Kiwis and the Americans. This isn't so much a steaming romance, though. This isn't a, a you know, romantic movie um, exactly, although it has moments. But it's more about, it seems like it's more of an intellectual film, at least that's how I see it, obviously, um, about these relationships and what they mean. Are they fraught? Do they make sense? Um Apparently, around 10,000 Kiwi women married Americans during the war. At least the movie claims that that's the case. What should we make of that? Does it make sense? Does it not? That's kind of the questions that the movie is asking. And as we go through the movie, we hear a lot of opinions about this. We hear just about every perspective about the situation. But we also see how these opinions are formed 
and we see how they are sometimes in tension, and we see how they change. To be more specific, one of the sisters, Delia, um, moves from Christchurch to Wellington. Uh, Christchurch, smaller town, Wellington, the big city, despite being married. There are lots of soldiers in Wellington, and her older sister Anne thinks that this is an improper and an indecent thing to do. It's promiscuous, right? She's married, but she's going to this place where there's all these men about. It's just not the thing to do for Anne. And in most movies of the era, these would just basically be stock characters, right? There would be one character who is the traditionalist and another character who is an adventurer. And the entire drama of the movie might unfold within that framework, right? That's the plot. Everything is going on within that, within these poles that we just kind of assume to exist. In this movie, we get a lot more than that. We get a bit of the why. Subtle, but we start to understand why people might come to that perspective. Or we might see how that perspective is really not as grounded as it first might be. And we see how the characters come to understand how their perspective is maybe not as rock solid. I don't want to spoil anything about this. I wish I could give you some very specific examples of times when characters change their minds, times when it is revealed that perhaps what a character held up as a moral consideration is maybe put in a different light later on. And maybe you see something about their personal context, about their personal preferences, inabilities, frailties, and how those might motivate a kind of moral position or something like that. Like I said, there's tons of great examples of this, but I don't want to spoil that because this movie is actually fairly unpredictable at times. There's some parts that are predictable, believe me. It's probably clear from the start that some people aren't going to come back from the war, for instance. There will be tragedy in this movie, obviously. But exactly how things are going to play out is harder to see. And I will say there are some, some twists in this movie that are, that are good. Um, some darker twists with a particular... I guess, poetic bend. And there are some lighter twists that are unexpected, uh, but fitting. Uh, it's safe to say, I think, that by the end of the story, nobody has much certainty about what the right path is. And if characters are to be asked later on what they think of these marriages, and, in fact, some of these characters may have to answer that question directly, well, they might not have much way of doing that. They might not have much way of being sure. Like I said, uncertainty, one of the cardinal virtues of Robert Anderson films, and I think of films in general, and it is on show throughout in this movie. Now, this may sound pretty good. Like I said, though, there are some flaws to this movie. So for one thing, it takes a little while to get going. The acting is pretty clunky in the beginning, and in general, the movie is pretty clunky. It feels like a 50s kind of genre thing in the beginning. Sandra D is poor throughout. Uh, her character, the youngest sister, is, yeah, Poor, poor, just kind of child acting throughout, unfortunately. There's a character named Shiner, which is the husband of one of these sisters. Very weak character throughout the film. Almost a caricature. He has maybe one moment of self-awareness. Um, but besides that, very weak character. Usually not the kind of thing you'd see in a Robert Anderson film, but it happens, I guess. One of the plot points towards the end of the film is pretty extreme and might throw you for a loop. I wasn't a huge fan of it, but... Uh, it is what it is. There are also some upsides. Um, this movie has some remarkably sincere moments in it. A lot of these involve Paul Newman, who is fantastic in this movie. There are a lot of moments where the melodrama kind of falls away and where we get real human insights, where there's an intellectual component, like I said, where there are interesting things to be said, but where there are also just real moments of real humanist moments in the film. Um, and yeah, this is Robert Anderson. In a nutshell, this is reminiscent to me of Tea and Sympathy, which is heavily kind of a 1950s genre film, um, but that, again, has, has moments. Um, there may be some similarity as well to the film On the Beach from 1959. I think the Stanley Kramer movie um, set in Australia. That's much more of a moralistic film, uh, and this is not. But that movie has also has powerful humanist moments in it too, but it's, it's more of an overarching moralistic film where this is more of a study of these wartime romance, and it is a surprisingly complex study at that. The final thing to say about this movie for me is that I think there was a particular resonance between, for me between this movie and between the pandemic that we faced in our current uh, uh, 
in our much more recent history and, and in the present. Uh, this is another event where, like the war, things are bizarre. Things go on pause. Things There's a vacuum. Um, life is weird. It's unprecedented. It's a bizarre turn of events. We do things that kind of make sense in certain contexts, but that are also completely strange and alien to us as well. In that context, that moral questions arise inevitably. Moral questions about when it's safe to do certain things, about what is right to do, about how to talk to other people, how to interact with your friends and your family in this situation, how to cope with other people who have different views, and things like that. Inevitable moral questions arise, perhaps similarly to when society is disrupted in the case of a war. And this movie gives us a vivid picture of how people's moral processes in this are not the moral processes of the jury that you see at the beginning. They're not the formal moral processes. They are the fraught, do-it-yourself, highly variable <laughs> moral processes. They can change. They can be based on things that are not so intellectual. They can be based on things that are maybe emotional or, or maybe something else. Um, I think there is a, a kind of a, a kind of a fundamental parallel between that, um, the the pandemic that we face now, and some of the some of the wartime uh, uh, questions that this movie brings up, and that's pretty interesting. Um, overall, I think this is a, is is a worthwhile movie to watch. It's it's definitely not, um, like I said, it's definitely one of the lesser uh, Robert Anderson films. Similarly, one of the lesser Robert Wise films. Um, but the cast is, is pretty good. Like I said, it, it definitely has its sincere moments, and it is definitely a Robert Anderson movie that has some real intellectual meat to it and is, in general, I think, worth watching if you're a fan of this kind of thing, if you're a fan of Robert Anderson, um, or if you like some of these some of these iconic um, actors and actresses who appear in the movie. So that's Until They Sail from 1957.